Welcome back. We continue our study of the apologists of the uh, early centuries. Our focus now turns to the West and the Latin West, and in particular, uh, North Africa. And we're going to uh, be learning a little bit more about Carthage and in a later lecture, Alexandria. But today our focus is going to be on two of the Latin apologists. The most important one among the two, I think, is Tertullian, but also important in his way is Cyprian, and we'll be looking at him in a, in a separate uh, recording. So let me get to uh, the subject of, uh, to the topic of Tertullian, and we'll introduce him first. However, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on Carthage in North Africa, uh, because it's one of the most important centers of the church and early Christian theology. It was, uh, it was a, a city that had a long and long history uh, going back. It was a Phoenician uh, colony going way back, a foe of Rome in the very famous uh, Punic Wars. You see the dates there. Um, and it, is, uh, it was and is, in some respects, uh, still today, an important city in, uh, now in North Africa, the modern city of the uh, uh, suburb of Tunis, the capital of Tunisia. It also had a, uh, a long role, in, uh, an important role in church history that we'll survey here very briefly uh, using uh, this uh, particular uh, website, the podcast, Five Minutes in Church History, produced by Stephen Nichols of Legionnaire Ministries, and I would I would encourage you to uh, check out some of those. Those are quite interesting and easily digested bits of uh, historical theology and church history. Uh, Carthage was uh, the home of Tertullian, and we're going to find out later it was a place where uh, a number of uh, early church fathers did their studies. Uh, from about 160 to 220, Tertullian was the one who gave us the word Trinity, and brought together the biblical teaching of who God is and his Trinitarian being. And so we have the word Trinity coined at Carthage, and that ought to be enough to uh, note, it, uh, note it as an important city. In the 250s AD, Cyprian was the bishop of Carthage, and we're going to be looking at Cyprian a little later. Yeah, this was on the heels of the Decian persecution, which we've already noted in a previous lecture. And after that persecution relented, folks were allowed back into the church. But that that even that process created a controversy known as the Donatist controversy, and uh, that kept uh, the church occupied for a number of centuries. And we'll have an opportunity to mention uh, Donatism a bit further when we get to uh, Augustine. Later on, in uh, 397, it was the site of the Third Council of Carthage, and uh, this was after our era, of course, but. Uh, in which the discussion, there was a discussion of the New Testament canon. And so Carthage was a place where these very important discussions about what books should officially be added to the canon were uh, undertaken. And then, uh, again, we will touch on this, uh, actually more than touch on it, we're going to talk about this when we get to Augustine. This is the place where the Pelagians were condemned at a council in 415, or 416, rather. So uh, this church had, a, or this city, rather, had a fascinating and rich history, both in terms of the ancient world and in church history. Well, let's turn our attention to uh, the uh, Latin apologist Tertullian. Tertullian was born about 145 or 150, depending upon the source you look at, to a Roman centurion uh, who was stationed in Carthage. So he wasn't African uh, by his heritage, but Roman. Uh, he was a he was trained in Greek and Latin, became a lawyer in Rome, he traveled to Rome and then uh, studied Rome there, where he was converted to Christianity. Uh, and uh, that was about uh, AD 185. But uh, at his conversion, uh, as is the testimony of many, and again, as we'll see when we get to Augustine, he rejected this licentious mode of life for Christian uh, ethics and, uh, and sanctification. Though we know very little about the details of his conversion, he said that he could not imagine uh, becoming a Christian without a conscious breach, a radical conversion. So, again, prior to his conversion, he'd indulged in a lot of licentious and sensual behavior, but uh, he, uh, he gave up all of that. And uh, one of the reasons that he gave was the, 
he was profoundly affected by the testimonies of Christians who were martyred in the arena. And uh, it was likely uh, that uh, his conversion was, was the result of uh, seeing those testimonies, uh, as we're going to see, and he's already seen with the uh, persecutions. He had a very famous quote about that. So he returned to Carthage. He gave himself passionately to the propagation and defense of the gospel there. Uh, a man of vast erudition, well taught, uh, a classically trained lawyer in rhetorical arts. Um, and uh, he was able to cite Greek and Latin authors very easily, so it meant that he had a very good classical education. Uh, but it was he who uh, disclaimed any reliance on Greek philosophy, as we're going to see. He's the one that coined the phrase, what has Jerusalem to do with Athens? So interestingly, whereas some of the other apologists that we've seen tried very conscientiously to uh, dovetail, to find ways to reconcile and and develop uh, Christian theology in the light of Greek philosophy, Tertullian at least uh, outwardly disclaimed that and thought that was a bad idea. We're going to see that more in a moment. Increasingly, he wrote the, in the vernacular Latin, and uh, because of that became the first one of the first great Latin church fathers. He sets the concepts of scripture in this new language, and much of the terminology that became normative in theological discussions in the Western church after Tertullian were actually uh, uh, basically his invention. He's probably best known for the quip we've already seen, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, although he probably didn't say it in just exactly that way. And again, he's also known for the quote, what has Jerusalem to do with Athens, by which he meant, why are we trying to do theology with Greek ideas mixed in? In Roger Olson's words, Tertullian was horrified by Clement, that's Clement of Alexandria, and so to Origins, and we're going to be looking at uh, the Alexandrines, as those men are called uh, in an upcoming lecture, uh, their approach to theology, again, which has it been with Justin and some of the other apologists to see if they couldn't uh, fit Greek philosophy together with Christian theology, and uh, Tertullian thought that was a singularly bad idea. Tertullian is remembered for his writings, which were influential in his time and later times. Uh, a number of qualities made him a great religious thinker. One was that he had a great mind. He uh, practiced uh, moral strictness in contradistinction to his uh, earlier life, and his conversion was total, and he uh, that led him to give up a successful career in the Roman legal profession, and we're going to see again something along the same lines with uh, his uh, uh, fellow North African uh, Latin father, uh, Augustine, later on. He was ordained a presbyter in the church in Carthage, so we know that he was more than just a, a lay uh, apologist, and he began writing books in defense of the faith. His writings can be divided into three main groups. First of all, the defense of Christianity, which he uh, wrote against Jews, and pagans, Gnostics, Marcians, as we we'll see, and even the Roman government, which meant that he was fairly bold. His uh, teachings, uh, uh, his direct teachings or doctrinal teachings on Christianity uh, and other uh, ecclesiastical subjects, such as baptism, the person of Christ, penance, and the resurrection. So he's, he's dealing with the issues that uh, the... Uh, third century church had to face, uh, again, some of the problems with uh, the, uh, the, the Gnostics and also the questions about, uh, as we've already seen with Irenaeus and, and others, the question of apostolic succession and who really is the one that we should be listening to to tell us uh, what is the true doctrine of the apostles. Uh, and then he dealt with the practice of Christianity, some practical issues, uh, moral subjects that he dealt with, he even had a treatise on how people should dress properly uh, and other sorts of uh, um, moral and ethical questions that he thought were important for uh, not only the uh, propagation of the Christian faith, but the maintain maintenance of uh, true Christianity practice. So there are 30 uh, odd, 30-some, uh, we should say, not odd, but 30 uh, amounting to 30 extant treatises by Tertullian. His apology, in particular, is important because it's addressed to Roman magistrates and defends Christians against the slanderous charges that we've seen back when we were talking about the persecution. Uh, and what he, he goes beyond that, however, and demands for them the same due process of law afforded by other citizens of the empire. So uh, where his lawyer's mind was uh, being applied to the defense of the faith. Other works dealing with practical aspects of Christian living, as we've already said, 
Um, vindications of Montanism, we're going to see in a moment that uh, those weren't necessarily a stellar part of his uh, career. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, defending against the failings of earthly Catholicism, he didn't just try to defend everything, but admitted there were some problems and sought to uh, uh, teach ways to correct some of those problems of church practice or uh, various sorts of, uh, again, practical aspects of Christian living. These later writings are, became very influential and contain some powerful and innovative expressions of Christian doctrine or dogma that were definitive for orthodoxy, as we're going to see. In response, it was in response to heresy that uh, Tertullian wrote against Prax Praxeus. Uh, and this is in, in this work, for the first time, the word Trinity was used, as we've already seen. Uh, he was the one that coined the term, but he used it in this uh, doctrinal uh, polemic uh, defense of orthodox uh, views relating the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And Tertullian said that, uh, very clearly said, that these three are one substance and not one person. So he's, he's close to what we're going to see uh, coming up when we talk about the uh, fourth century debates leading up to the, uh, the Nicene Creed. He's very close to that already. His against Praxeus was uh, famed in particular for its affirmation that Jesus Christ had two natures joined in one person. So not only did he anticipate what came to be known as Nicene Orthodoxy concerning the Trinity, he also anticipated the Orthodoxy of uh, the Council of Chalcedon that we'll be seeing in a later lecture that uh, articulated correctly uh, how we should think about the two natures of Christ. His longest book was against Marcion, and uh, that was a defense of the church and its uh, canon, the Christian canon. Marcion was a, a Gnostic heretic who taught that the Old Testament God was inferior, and for that reason, uh, he rejected the Old Testament. We've already discussed Marcion a little bit earlier. Uh, Tertullian defended the use of the Old Testament as Christian scriptures, uh, and that uh, he used these scriptures to defend against these uh, Gnostic heretics, which he saw as a major threat to the church of his day. Tertullian did more than anyone else to overthrow the influence of the Gnostics, uh, at least in the, uh, in the uh, Western part. Tertullian was a key player in the uh, transition of the church from a persecuted minority to the major influence in Roman society. And again, he anticipated some of the ways that the, the church managed to uh, navigate around these persecutions until it became a uh, legitimate and even the uh, primary uh, religion in the Roman Empire uh, into the 4th century. However, later in his life, possibly because of a dispute with Roman bishops, he adopted uh, Montanism, and uh, Montanism was an early heretical movement who was, uh, that was condemned by the church, was founded by an individual named Montanus, who was a self-proclaimed prophet uh, from back east, we joined with two prophetesses, prophetesses, Prisca and Maximilla, and they called themselves the mouthpiece, mouthpiece of the Holy Spirit. The, the uh, Montanist even claimed to be the paraclete himself, anticipated in uh, the Gospel of John in the Farewell Discourse in John 14, 15, and 16. Uh, Montanism was an early example of um, uh, aberrations that have affected the church, again, since this very early time of um, speaking in tongues, seeing visions, and other ecstatic religious experiences. Um, again, Tertullian may have been drawn to Montanism because it, was, it had a very strict uh, view of uh, how to live the Christian life. Despite that move, his early writings maintained their popularity and value among his peers and have remained to be a valuable part of the Christian heritage even down to this particular day. What well, we're going to pause here. We'll pick up uh, in a separate recording the um, Latin apologist of uh, Cyprian.